you know, to run a practice, you have to be able to have straightforward, upfront conversations about money. Business of Architecture UK, episode 37. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Special announcement, the next BOA UK live event, the first one of 2019, is coming to you on Tuesday, the 5th of March. It will be held in the UNI offices, 7A Howick Place in Victoria, southwest London, and there will be a discussion panel of industry thought leaders, in entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, architects, discussing the seven threats to an architectural practice. Now, early bird tickets are now on sale. I'm going to put the link and the information uh, underneath this podcast. So book your tickets right away, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hello, and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. And this is the first podcast of 2019. So happy new year. I hope you've all had a fantastic festive break. And we kick off the new year speaking with co-founder of Cove Burgess, Tim Burgess. And this was a great interview. Tim is an architect. He's been in practice by himself for about 10 years. Cove Burgess has been going for about five years. He's very experienced working with funds, family offices, long-term investors, and helping them manage their portfolios. And I met Tim in the sort of middle of 2018, or the latter part of 2018, as he was a listener of the podcast, and he got in touch, and we ended up having a cup of coffee. And we spoke for about three and a bit hours, and it was one of those amazing conversations where... I mean, I was just fascinated by Tim's entrepreneurial expert expertise, his business experience, uh, and just his passion for entrepreneurship within architecture. And from that point, I knew I had to get him on the podcast and do an interview just to hear some of his story, how he's progressed as a sole practitioner and how he's evolved his practice, now working with his partner, Daniel Cove, um, and how they've grown their business into what it is today. So this podcast is filled with some amazing stories. Uh, Tim gives some really, really good advice about some of uh, some of the things that he's learned through making mistakes, um, which I think are very, very applicable for every business, not alone just architects. So sit back, relax and enjoy Tim Burgess. Ryan Millard here, Business of Architecture UK, and today I have the great privilege of speaking with Tim Burgess, co-founder of Coves and Burgess. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. It's great to um, sit down and actually capture some of our conversations. We've spoken before a lot about business and you are a real advocate for being an entrepreneur, for business in architecture, uh, and you've kind of really... You're your own business acumen and knowledge and insight is really fascinating. So I really hope that we get to capture some of that and share it with our audience. I hope so too. So the first question is, tell me about how you got started and where, well actually where you, where you are at now and how you got started. Okay, so now we are a practice of 10 uh, people. Myself and my co-founder uh, run the practice uh, with architects, assistants and uh, some studio support. Um, and we're a fairly well-rounded, robust outfit. It wasn't always that way. Uh, and so I started um, nearly 10 years ago when I jumped out of a big practice, decided that it would be more fun to try and paddle my own canoe and do it for myself. And I, I started with no plan whatsoever. I mean, literally nothing. And um, I had two very small children, a six-month-old you know, baby and a right. uh, two-and-a-half-year-old. Uh, and so much to the disappointment of my wife, I announced I was quitting the full-time, well-paid job to just chance it and go it alone, which you can imagine she was thrilled about. Super excited, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, just dived in because I just, I always had the idea that I wanted to have my own practice. It was just from day one, that was the idea of being an architect, mm. do your own thing. Um, so I started with just scrabbling around any which way to take on private work. And it was literally people I knew, the kind of mums network through NCT, anyone want a house extension. Uh, and over those next few years, 
through just talking to anybody I could, thinking of any which way to market myself, putting flyers through doors, putting things in local magazines, anything. Just try try all sorts, see what yielded a result, mm. do more of it, kind of. Um, anyway, so that built up the practice to I was doing reasonable size private residential projects. Uh, so refurbishments of houses that were getting on towards three quarters of a million quid mm. or uh, just started to break into new build houses. And was it just you? Just me. Exactly. Had an architect, a student worked for me, then an architect worked for me and a student and an architect. And that was about the point where I met, uh, well, I started with my now partner, mm. Dan, who I'd met through teaching because we were both visiting tutors at the University of Bath. Right. And uh, we, on those train journeys back and forth to Bath, um, over bottles of red wine, put the world to rights and realised that we had this kind of shared worldview which mm. was, and a shared sense of humour, which is really helpful, yeah. uh, I have to say. Um, but completely different backgrounds, completely different experiences and frankly, completely different types of people. Right. I now realise, which was an enormous asset that we are chalk and cheese, mm. but the, the shared sense of humour and the idea that we could do something which was greater than the sum of its parts was the thing that built the now practice. Right. And so Dan came from a much bigger commercial practice with um, a knowledge of how to do jobs at scale and a black book of potential uh, clients who we could start talking to and so we brought those two sorts of you know disparate backgrounds together to build what is now Cove Burgess. And what was the major change then what how did the how did going from solo practitioner how quickly did the business expand when it was two of you because this is a really interesting conversation about how you go from solo architect to 10 person practice and beyond. So um, the change at the time for me seemed utterly radical. Looking back, it was probably uh, a steady organic growth. Mm. But Dan's view always was go and win the work, work out how to do it afterwards. For me at the time, that was a terrifying prospect. I was much more like how things get done oriented. And if I couldn't see that we already had resource capacity and all those things, I was terrified about pitching for things that were beyond our capability. I have to say now, that is the that is the norm, that one is always pitching slightly beyond what you're capable of doing in order to then grow into that space. Uh, and that's a useful thing to have learned, but I learned the hard way yeah. because I was, I was dropped into that quite uh, you know, quickly by my partner. Um, and we um, won opportunities and then employed people to kind of fill into the spaces, which actually was happened at a relatively steady pace. That it was to it, well, I um, when we started, I had an architect and a student working for me, so we started with two partners and two assistants, and then gradually added people on, kind of you know, at a rate of one every uh, four to six months, up to you know. 10 people and where we've been fairly steady over the past year or two. Mm. And what kind of scale of projects are you working on now? It varies uh, from a, our sweet spot is kind of a million to say 10 million mm. and we've got one which is now 16 million so uh, that's where we'd like to be headed. Great and what was and what were the biggest obstacles because that's um, talking about not knowing how you're going to deliver something but still putting yourself out there to pitch for it. That is such a uh, courageous thing to do. And also it can be such an inhibitor for so many businesses where if you can't see the how, then you won't ever put yourself out there. What were the sorts of things that you had to overcome internally to be able to do that? And obviously it was great that you had a partner. And what are, what are the sort of um, the success, the elements that make you to a successful partnership? Oh, there's a lot in there. Yes, sorry, that's it. Uh... Right, <clears throat> I'm going to start. We'll go backwards. Yeah. Um, the two, the thing that makes us a successful partnership, um, I now understand, but I've only just become to understand that, and that is um, Dan's skill set is to firstly be the best intuitive designer I've ever met. Mm. That's pretty useful. And secondly, he has an amazing skill to tell stories and to just win people's attention. And when he's in that space of pitching, 
he's like a kind of missile that just charges forwards and puts more enthusiasm and determination into pitches than any human being I've ever seen. That's very helpful for me because my demeanour is completely different, which is to be much more cerebral, thoughtful, considerate, gentle uh, and empathetic. And really my skill set is in the bringing people together, organisation, uh, building a kind of consensus and sometimes acting as a critic and a balance. Yeah. And so it's that, that complementary skill set which... Um, is much greater than the sum of its parts. Mm. Now, going backwards into the, you know, how did we push on through to win projects beyond what we were really capable of doing? That's partly down to um, previous experience before we came into the practice that we both knew we were capable of doing bigger projects than we had done as a practice. So we had some of those skill sets and some of those prior examples, but we also knew and understood what sort of competition we'd be up against and how much resource they could put into winning projects. So we knew that as the underdogs, we always had to outgun everybody. Mm. You know, always outnumbered, but never outgunned was the kind of motto. Yeah. So that when we decided we were pitching for something, we would go all out hell for leather and do more than anyone else would because we did unreasonable amounts in a pitch on the basis that we didn't have the portfolio. So unless we blew them out of the water in the room, it probably wasn't going to happen. Mm. And so what would, so what would in, what's your process when you do have a, a piece of work or you're working with a new developer, perhaps developers already got a, a selection of architects that they've worked with before, who might be higher up the list than you guys. What are, what's the sort of process from initial inquiry or you've got a sense that there's a job that's going? How, so, do, you, how do you work it through? How do you get that? I'm going to tackle that question from a slightly different approach, okay. which is the main way that we win projects is actually being referred by somebody else. Right. And so when I think about our um, marketing database, there's people who we consider as principal. In other words, the people who will give you the job, the fund, the developer, whoever it might be. And there are these other body of people, which I think of as gatekeepers, and they are the project managers, the planning consultants, those other people that if you've worked with before and you've built relationships with, and they say to you, or they say to a client, you know, you should go and talk to Tim. He, he would be the right guy for this job. If you can get someone to say that about you, you're most of the way toward getting a job. Mm. And that is the way that many of our, our um, business leads come to us now is through that referral point. It's very rare that we are cold pitching for something to someone right. who doesn't know us. Right, okay. And that's, um, you know, that's where as a, as a business now and as a strategy for going forwards, we try to cultivate mm. that we don't ever want to be cold pitching or in cold competition. Yeah against a bunch of others where people don't already know who you are because you're just, you know, you're going up the north face of the Eiger rather than taking the, <laughs> uh, the kind of, you know, uh, funicular up the other side. Yeah. And there's just better ways of doing it. And have you done that before? Have you learned through experience of like being in the position of cold pitching for something and it just being a large amount of resource expended and it not working? Yes. <laughs> in a nutshell yeah and you learn the hard way i mean you know doing open competitions i would say if if you've got nothing better to do with your time go for it because you might <laughs> you might just might uh get some good pr out of it mm. and we've done we have done um open competitions where we have got good PR out of it for specific reasons that we've done it because we think there's something that we're doing at the moment we're interested in that we can showcase through doing a competition but doing them for their own sake as a way of winning work is madness yeah um so yeah that's as so what, what have been the biggest obstacles that you've experienced in business over the last five years since you've been in partnership and how have you overcome them gosh they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, I don't know. It's difficult to say a single a single obstacle that I've overcome. I mean, I would say on one level, probably the biggest obstacle is inherent in myself, mm. <laughs> in having to slightly rewire my brain and how I think about things, and also getting over the slight sense of imposter syndrome. 
yeah. where you, for all sorts of reasons, convince yourself that you're not quite ready, mm. you're not able to do whatever it is you need to do, and to push yourself out of your comfort zone. Uh, probably that is the biggest obstacle, which is still the biggest obstacle in yeah. many ways. Um, is yeah is 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 all of the um self-limiting beliefs yeah i think you would call it and how and how have you taken those on because that's really that's something that i think a lot of architects don't talk about is the internal conversations a lot of business people don't necessarily explicitly talk about it and yet Uh, it probably is the most profound part of business is when you confront yourself and the way that you've always done things yes Absolutely true. And um, so I was lucky because I came across something very, very early in my, um, when I was considering setting up a practice. And I happened to read a book, buy a book, which was called something like How to Be Brilliant, one of those t- terribly cheesy things. And it was like a cry for help where I picked up this thing. Yeah. So uh, I've, I've got bookshelves of those types of books. <laughs> good. I'm in a safe space. I can talk about those. Um, and the um, author had gone through this uh, sort of proposition where he said, think about all the things in your life that are causing you stress and strain and all of the problems you've got and do that, what he called a pity path, just write down everything. What's stopping you achieving your goal? What's stopping you? Uh, and then out of that lot, boil it down to um, what are the key kind of rocks in the way? And I, at the time, was thinking, I'm fed up in practice and I feel a bit stuck and I don't. I feel like a bit of a misfit and I want to run my own practice and what do I do? Mm. And I thought about all those things and it came down to a couple of very, very simple things. Am I really good enough? Mm. Being the key question and B, I'm frightened because I step out into the big wide world. What if I fail? What if it all is, I discover that I can't do it and I'm a failure yeah. and it's all for nothing. And then I have to crawl back to, you know, please give me a job <laughs> or whatever it might be. And um, he suggested creating your own mantra, which is the antidote to your biggest fear. And my mantra was, I am a brilliant and fearless architect who brings joy and magic to everything I do. Love it. And that was 10 years ago. And that is now burned into my brain. I don't still say it to myself on a daily (laughs) basis, I should say. But at the time, it was the thing which started to build a kind of armor around me Mm. of self-belief, of actually being the antidote to my biggest fear, which stopped me making the step. And that was the thing that opened the door to firstly quitting a job, setting up a practice and simply beginning. And it was only by doing that and jumping off the cliff and, you know, figuring out how to pull the parachute before you hit the ground, Mm. which started the process of what is now a kind of lifetime learning. Yeah. And um, that really is the key, that one is always on now that perpetual journey to to absorb information and learning and grow and change to become the person who will take you to the next step. Mm. And it's that sort of strange concept of, you know, the self-limiting belief piece uh, and that actually the biggest piece of work that always needs to be done is on yourself because, yes. you know, you are the vehicle to the next step, but you have to be prepared to take it. Yeah. And you only do that through that ed- that perpetual self-education kind of process. And what kind of education and mentorship? Do you use mentors? Do you have people? I do. So I, my initial learning was I became a voracious reader. Yeah. Uh, Audio books, podcasts, Ryan. Very good. <laughs> uh, and any of those sources of information, which, um, but reading really is the primary, um, the primary thing where I just read lots and lots of business books of all varieties. And anytime I feel I'm, I'm lacking some kind of skill set somewhere, that's where I go. And some time back, a couple of years ago, I realized that I was getting to a point where I needed some external advice. Mm. And so I would also attend um, anything I could, which was, you know, seminars, learning things. And I went to the RIBA um, small practice conference. And at the end of that day, they had a thing called, uh, no, what was it? Speed mentoring. Right. Like speed dating, but with people who actually knew how to run practices. And I saw that Peter Morris was at the event. So I put him as my first choice, you know, AHMM, one of the most successful practices in London, won the Sterling Prize, smashing it on all levels. And I thought, 
brilliant. I'd love to speak to Peter Morris. I don't know the guy at all, but it would be amazing to chat to him. And I met him and I was stunned by the fact that he was just a regular guy who I kind of, you know, very humble. And and so I just asked him out straight, have you ever mentored anyone? And would you think about it? Uh, and so he said, sure, let's meet for a coffee. And he uh, agreed to mentor me, uh, which has been absolutely amazing and a sort of, you know, game changer really. And what, and what does that involve? Well, uh, Peter gives me a couple of hours of his time every um couple of months and we get together and the one thing he'd asked me to do uh, because he said to me I, he had mentors throughout his entire career and that was what inspired him to accept this idea of mentoring me uh, and he asked me to do the thing that his mentor asked him to do which is after each meeting write a note of what you think you got out of the meeting and so that became the discipline of I would go and I would write him a note and say these are the things that are happening right now and this is what's on my mind and then I would go and have these conversations with Peter, which went in the most amazing kind of directions. And after the meeting, I would literally write him a note saying, this is what I think I learned. Uh, and then I would send that to him. Uh, and then that would be the basis of when we next met and next spoke. And were, they, were these sales meetings or all kinds of meetings that were happening within your business? Sales meetings? Uh, no, not at all. These were, um, the, when I spoke to Peter, it was very much about what, need, what one needed to learn to run a practice right. and um, the personal journey that you go on in doing that. Yeah. Uh, and all of the sort of complexity of, you know, having partners and having a kind of coherent vision for a business and uh, a kind of a purpose that you can share with other people and the way that's not quite the same as um, what your marketing message is per se. Right. But it's, you know, and so it was the whole, it was the whole thing about uh, a about the process of learning to run a business, but in its deepest sense of, mm. you know, who you are, who the other people are that you run the business with and how collectively you form a kind of coherent vision to take the thing forward. So how has that manifested in your practice? How would you say that you've kind of cultivated and made your practice? What is it that makes your practice unique? Oh, well, um, I my biggest learning journey of the recent time is... Um, through the conversations with Peter, um, I realized that I need to do a much more um, in-depth um, piece about how to run a business properly. And I embarked on um, a thing called the Business Growth Program at Cranfield University, which I've just completed. And that is a fantastic uh, experience because it's a course set up for owner managers, uh, owner managers of businesses um, of a certain size mm. um, but businesses from all around the country doing all sorts of different things and it's a very short course which is a series of residential weekends where you go and stay in the university and do these sort of double days of Friday, Saturday intense kind of learning uh, and then go away, write a business plan which you'll then go and re reviewed on and as part of that you are brought through the process of a sort of, you know, an MBA crunched down into this very short space of time where you are forced to understand um, how to analyze a market, how to understand, you know, your client base, how to identify a sort of strategy which works within that mm. framework and then to articulate that in a way which makes sense. And of course, what's extraordinary about that is when you meet people who, you know, the haulage guys who are running a business in uh, you know, the middle of the country, the guy who does uh, printing, a firm up in the north of England, the guy that has a sock factory, the bloke that's a farmer. I mean, these are amazing, amazing. people from all over the place. You start to see an architecture practice in the light of you know, business as a much bigger thing and that you are a professional consultancy and what exactly that means, that you don't make stuff and widgets and you don't have really expensive equipment and kit, you know, a million and a half piece of machinery that prints on flower pots or whatever <laughs> it might be. And actually, you don't have any unique equipment or unique processes that can't be replicated elsewhere. And the only thing which is unique about a professional consultancy is the degree to which you understand your clients and the relationships you have with them. And that was a real sort of like aha moment for me mm. because I think one sort of intuitively understands that, but to be have it sort of writ large and have the spotlight shone upon that in such a sort of 
brutal way where every all the artifice is stripped away and you realize that that is what's unique about every professional consultancy is your relationships with people external to your business is the fundamental basis on which your business that's a very is built. profound shift in the way that you might view the practice of architecture absolutely because you're for now focusing on the quality of relationships and that the design is a function of that and I mean, you were saying before that many architects, we like to think that what makes us unique is our design process and our ability to, you know, how we express our architecture, which is, you know, there's, there is, you know, there is a uniqueness about that. But yes, it's absolutely right, because I think, you know, as designers, we want to feel the thing that is unique always is the design. Yeah. And that somehow that it's so special and so unique that people will seek us out because of this wonderful design. But what we fail to sometimes realize is that from the outside looking back in, that's not how the rest of the world see us. And that's quite a strange concept. And we were chatting earlier on about this, and I was made the example of when we go to a lawyer or a solicitor, those people know the finer points of their particular skill set, mm. which to us is kind of invisible. Yeah. And we say, well, you know, I'm coming to you because you're, you're a lawyer, so I'm taking care. I, I sort of uh, have faith in you. You can do the law bit. And the questions I'm asking is, you know, ha have you really listened to me? Do you really understand my particular problem? Um, do I trust you? You know, do I think I can get on with you? All those other things, which are the kind of soft parts of the edges that I think sometimes when you're in the world of design and technical delivery and all those things, one sees as a slight side mm. issue and kind of on the periphery, whereas actually to most of your clients who probably don't really understand architecture per se. So they use a different set of measurements as to how they judge how good an architect you are. Yeah. And those are often things like, you know, is he listening to me? Did he respond when I tried to get in touch with him? How good is the communication? You know, do I get great communication where I don't have to chase him? You know, that the architect is telling me what's happening as it's happening. Even when nothing's happening, they're still in touch with me, communicating. Mm. You know, and so I think that was the thing that I learned from that process of what is unique about us is the degree to which we understand our clients, immerse ourselves in their world, and then communicate with them. And on every level of the business, that that's what we aim to do. Mm. And how do, how do you communicate that with your own staff? How are they involved in that process as well? Ah, that's, that's also part of the process that we are now, um, it, well, at the beginning of starting a kind of internal school and yeah. I have something which I now call Wednesday morning learning because Wednesday is the day when I can get into the office early and I get everyone to come in early, buy them croissants, bribe them basically, <laughs> croissants. With a nice lunch and some coffee. good coffee. Um, and we have internal sessions to focus on particular things about how the business runs, uh, how we do things. And that can be anything from like, you know, what exactly is in a feasibility study um, to, um, you know, who are our clients and what do they look for from mm. us? And that those, uh, you know, ongoing conversations is, I think at core, we understood that most of our clients who are in the world of property aren't really, you know, designed, well, they're not design people. They're not even really property people. They're mostly money people mm. who are interested in property as an asset. And so once you start to understand that, you realize that when you give them a feasibility study, they tend to kind of skip right to the back page where the area schedule is because they want to see the numbers first. But once you understand that, you start thinking, okay, so we're going to design this building, which we believe is a, you know, going to be a really fantastic, beautiful piece of work. But the way we present that, whether we communicate that, will be translated into client-focused language where we'll probably lead with the numbers and go into the design second because that's what's going to make them most comfortable. Yes, yeah, brilliant. Now that's that's it's so so insightful to to hear that, um, and actually that's even got me thinking about my own communication processes with clients, and that that is that's what makes us a unique practice. That's what that's what's right. at the core. That's one of the things that we can tangibly control, and you know make think about the user experience. But I think it's um, it's that that's particular to our practice mm. in the environment we work in. But for other practices, working for different types of clients with you know different drivers and um, you know very different backgrounds 
it's a case of each each practice thinking mm. what is genuinely the environment in which I work what am I selling to these people and what is it that they really value but generally you know relationships and communications are going to be involved in almost all architectural practices but the nature of that communication and the nature of those relationships is specific to those different types of clients i think yeah yeah so another conversation that we had earlier is was about oxygen tanks <laughs> and i wanted you to recount that that story because it's a lovely way to sort of wrap up this conversation as well, because it, right. was, it, was it was quite a profound story as well. Well, that goes back to that, I, that thing of business learning and being perpetually learning things and putting them into action. And I was saying to you, um, I'm going to start by saying the thing about, you know, disaster and failure. And most yeah. people see disaster uh, or success often as, you know, big things that come like meteors into your life and sort of explode. And often... They're not that at all. They're habits learned over time of little things that you repeat again and again and again, which build up to something. And the best example that I had of that was the oxygen tank story, where I had um, picked up a piece of information from reading a book by Jim Collins. And if you ever want a good book on business, I'd start there. (laughs) Uh, And he told the story of um, people who climbed up tall mountains, Mount Everest and the like, and that they took precautions beyond what was normally reasonable, where when they climbed the mountain, they took far more oxygen tanks than they would ever need, and then they would leave them on the side of the mountain as they climbed up, on the basis that if everything went wrong, they knew that they could get down to the next stop where there would be more oxygen and the next stop and the next stop. And he talks about the need for, in every business, to make sure that there was always some oxygen tank, some reserve, should everything go wrong. And at the point I read that story, I thought, ah, we need to start putting some oxygen tanks aside for if something unforeseen happens. And at that time, I started religiously taking a small slice of every piece of money that came into the practice and putting it in a separate account outside of all the practice finances which I'd simply called the vault. <laughs> and it was like money we just put aside and forgot about. And it was two, two and a half percent of turnover effectively. Mm. Um, and when we had, um, we'd won the biggest project we'd ever taken on, got stuck into it, got the payment schedule all sorted out, begun the project midway through a really chunky payment schedule. Suddenly the client stopped paying us completely without reason and unforeseen. And then, you know, a month went by and we we're saying, what's going on? Oh, you know, we're just sorting out the funding. It's just got slightly delayed. It's, it's all fine. It's getting, it's coming. Another month went by and suddenly we were running out of money and it was all getting very, very difficult. Mm. And it was at that point where I realized that, you know, I had to break into the vault and it was those oxygen tanks during that period that basically kept a practice of 10 people alive yeah. whilst we had a major and completely unforeseen, unpredictable, you know, black swan event yeah. that came from nowhere. And, you know, at one point we were 100K in the wrong side of where you should be. And if I hadn't have had money put aside, it would have been curtains. Mm. And that was a really, um, you know, valuable experience to learn and a, a stroke of luck frankly that i picked up that piece of information at that time and some a decision i'd made two and a half years ago was what saved my backside yeah you know in that moment where it all gone haywire wow and then did you get paid in the end oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and how did you how did you because that's interesting as well because a client might not necessarily know the stress that a delayed payment is having on your business how do you after something like that, how do you rebuild the relationship? How do you communicate that with a client? And also, how do you, what processes do you have in place now? So you have uh, a discipline of putting money aside. So you've always got reserves, that, so you can always defend yourself against that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but how do you now set up conversations with clients to prevent that from happening in the in the future? That's a good question. I mean, I think we've always been pretty good about having robust agreements. Um, and I've sort of doubled down on that ever since that event mm. um, where we just have, you know, what I would call mature conversations. And one of the things I think that's important when you run an architectural practice is to get over the idea that it's a bit difficult talking about money 
It's like, if that's how you feel, you're in the wrong game. You know, to run a practice, you have to be able to have straightforward, upfront conversations about money. Because, you know, that is the lifeblood on which practices run. And if you aren't running the business, there is no architecture. It's all going to be over before you know it. Yeah. And so we have very straightforward conversations with people about what the agreements are and what our expectations are. Um, and now we stick to them, you know, very clearly that if there's a problem with payment, then we're, you will be having a face-to-face -face conversation with me about it. And that will be that. Is that something you actually say you say at the very beginning of a relationship? It depends. Um, I mean, one of the key things I think with all of these things is your selection of clients mm. because ultimately um, the better sort of pedigree of clients one has, you know, and we, for example, now prefer working with funds rather than developers per se because a fund has the money developers generally don't have the money and they're borrowing the money off someone else which is often where you get problems and then you go to private clients who you know come with their own uh, idiosyncrasies <laughs> but often it's their money they're not borrowing money it's theirs and so you can be much more sort of straightforward and it's much more personal um and so i don't kind of really push the point you know hard too early if i'm working with a fund you know, we all know that it's going to be kind of okay. And we set out our terms, we get written agreements and it's all in writing. Mm. And as soon as, I mean, it's very rare that anything goes wrong with the funds. It's only with the developers. And it's usually because they themselves are in all sorts of, you know, trouble rather than they're deliberately trying to stitch you up. They've just mismanaged their own finances yeah. usually. And when they're in that place, there's not really much anyone can do. Yeah. And so in a sense, you've just got to, you know, be kind of straightforward and robust about the conversations. But but you are having conversations rather than just throwing your toys out of the pram. Yes. You know, you are trying to genuinely understand what is the issue? Is there anything we can help with? And keep those conversations going. But being fairly sort of straightforward about, OK, do we need to put a payment plan into place? Do we need to do something else? Yeah. Um, and again, it comes yeah. back to communication. Absolutely. It's the bedrock of everything. Yeah. Brilliant. So what's next? What's what's happening in 2019? Wow. Well, I've got now a fairly extensive and solid business plan that I've got to um, put into place. Yeah. And the next part of that is um, a fairly detailed um, plan of um, our marketing strategy. And I've got to continue on a journey which I've already begun, which is making sure my practice runs in a really straightforward, solid way that I'm not necessarily involved day to day in the projects anymore. And I can spend much more of my time outward facing. Uh, and frankly, you know, with people who I already know, don't yet know, sort of know, um, bringing in the next load of jobs. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. It's been a delight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Now, don't forget, early bird tickets are now on sale for the next BOA UK live event, which is the seven threats to an architectural practice happening Tuesday, 5th of March, 2019. Book your tickets now. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.